A warm greeting and very good evening, everyone. The most awaited part of basic module in infectious disease cycle two is live now. I am Dr. Sri Vishwapal, FCPA Critical Care for, uh, Forum member. I am here to moderate the session. Hope everyone had attended the first cycle of infectious disease module, uh, which was so brief about the bugs causing infection and antimicrobials. F FCPA Infectious Disease Forum member are now with the new different topics moving to advanced level in the whole cycle. As many of us know, various antibiotics have various dilutions and change in dilution affects the drug potency and even it may get degraded or oxidized. So selection of diluent and altering the dilution is very much important. We could see many drugs are administered in a same line with a three-way or five-way port. So in that time, physical, physical and chemical incompatibility of a drugs administered should be checked. So today's topic is understanding the infectious, understanding the intravenous antimicrobial dilution and drug compatibilities. I am glad to, I am glad to welcome Dr. Harita Rajakrishnan, clinical pharmacist, Department of GI Surgery and Solid Organ Transplant, Amrita Institute of Medical Science and Research Center, Kochi. Welcome you, Dr. Harita Rajakrishnan. Uh, can we move to next slide? Before starting the presentation, I would like to mention a few things to the audience. Uh, the question and answer session will be uh, a question and answer, question and answer will be uh, I will be discussed at the end of the presentation. So you can post your question and the comment box and click the submit button. Uh, by the end of session, we will discuss about it. Next, next slide. You can submit the feedback after the session. The this will be okay. So this will be available below the comment box. Once submitting the feedback within 14 days, you will receive the participation certificates. Yeah. So certificates will be generated as per the data entered in your profile. The slide presentation will be available for download at the end of the session. To download. We have to log in through FCPA official website. So over to Dr. Rita. Um, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you so much to FCPA uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, just uh, once I would like to confirm whether my slides are visible and my audio is clear. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, okay. thank you. So, um, so as you know, the topic for today is uh, intravenous antimicrobial diluents and uh, drug compatibilities. So here are my uh, disclosures. So through my presentation, uh, I would like to talk on uh, the basics of intravenous drug diluents and the need to choose the right diluent and also a few basics about the drug incompatibilities. Now, what are the common diluents that we commonly use? So I'm sure uh, most of you must be familiar with the following fluids. Uh, we have dextrose 5%, normal saline 0.9%, and ringer's lactate. So knowing the name of the diluent or the fluid is not just enough. So it's always important to know the composition of each fluid. It's not just about the fluid. If you take any drug, it is important to know the composition of each and any fluids or drug that you take. So dextrose 5% is nothing but uh, your dextrose monohydrate and water for injection. Normal saline 0.9% is uh, sodium and uh, water for injection. Whereas Ringer's lactate, it contains more complex electrolytes, uh, including sodium fluoride, sodium lactate, potassium fluoride, um, calcium chloride dihydrate, and water for injection. So among these, the most commonly used diluent is, as you know, dextrose and saline. Whereas lactate ringer is not commonly used, there are various reasons for that. First is because of its lack of commercially available appropriate volume sizes. And as I said, it has more complex electrolytes. So most of the time, it tends to react or interact with the other drugs that we routinely give to the patients. And also it contains a lot of buffers, including lactate, acetate, and gluconate. So if you take a critically ill patient who is admitted in the ICU, most of the time the patient is having some kind of electrolyte imbalance. It could be hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, or even hyperkalemia. 
So when you administer lactic ringer along with it, it tends to cause more imbalances in electrolytes and therefore it is not a commonly used diluent. Now for a, just a basic understanding, I have mentioned few uh, fluids here. So I just want you to take a minute and answer which among these cannot be used or is not used as an IV diluent. So right, the first one is distilled water. So is there anything else that cannot be used here? It is your dextrose 10%. Now, what is the reason? Why cannot, be, okay, why cannot these be used as a drug diluent? So to answer that question, you need to be friendlier with the term tonicity. So when you take each fluid, it has a particular tonic tonicity to it, towards it. So you must have heard about hypertonic solution, isotonic and hypotonic solution. But what does that mean? So hypertonic solutions means it contains a higher solute concentration compared to the intracellular solute concentration. So in such cases, what happens? You, you must have learned about the osmosis when you're lower classes. So in order to balance out the equilibrium, to maintain an equilibrium state, what happens is that the free water moves out of the cell into the solution and hence it can result in cell shrinkage. And that's what you can see in the first image. Now coming to the isotonic solutions, it has the same solute concentration compared to the intracellular solute concentration. And because it's already balanced out, there is no net movement of water and hence there is no change in the shape of the cell. Now coming to hypotonic solution, it has a lower solute concentration compared to the intracellular solute concentration. And hence what happens, the direct opposite of what happens during the hypertonic state. There is net movement of free water into the cell and hence there is cell swelling. So there is your hypertonic, isotonic and hypotonic solution. Now, coming back to the question that I asked first, why is distilled water and dextrose 10% not used as a diluent? Simple, distilled water is your hypotonic solution. So when you administer a diluent or you administer distilled water, what happens is that there is cell swelling. Whereas dextrose 10%, as you know, it has a greater concentration. It has a higher concentration. Because of the same, there is net movement of water out of the cell and there is cell shrinkage, which in turn leads to cell death. So that's just the basics of what you need to know about a diluent or any IV fluid for that matter. So as I mentioned earlier, the most common diluents for all medications, most of the time, are either normal saline, 0.9% NaCl or dextrose 5%. But there are certain medications which has to be exclusively diluted in either normal saline or dextrose. So what happens if uh, you administer a particular drug that has to be diluted in normal saline with the dextrose? Is it okay? I mean, in some situations, we have to do it. So can we do that? The answer is no. Why? Because it can lead to drug incompatibility. And this drug incompatibility could be either a physical, chemical, or therapeutic one. So what does drug incompatibility mean? It's a physical or chemical reaction that occur in vitro between two or more drugs when these solutions are combined together in a syringe or an IV bag or a bottle tubing. So as I said, there are three different types of incompatibility. It's physical incompatibility, chemical incompatibility, and therapeutic incompatibility. So what do they mean? Physical incompatibility, as the name itself suggests, is something that is visible to the naked eye. So it can actually lead into a physical precipitation or it can cause a change in color and consistency or even opalescence. Whereas chemical incompatibility means it can cause chemical reaction between the two drugs or two different solutions that we have taken together. It could be either an oxidation reaction, photolysis, reduction, or racemization. So these chemical incompatibility could uh, be either visible to the naked eye or not. But just because it does not form a physical precipitate does not mean it's not com it's uh, compatible. It, there might be some reaction which can render the drug in, uh, ineffective. Now coming to therapeutic incompatibility, it's the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions that occur between the two solutions or the two drugs. So what happens in such cases? It leads to therapeutic failure. 
So you might administer two drugs together or two antimicrobials together in the thought that, okay, fine, it will get a synergistic action because the patient is ill. So we might, it's better to give a broader coverage. So you administer two antibiotics together. But in case they are incompatible, especially therapeutic incompatibility exists between them, it can lead to therapeutic failure. So um, the drug incompatibility, as I mentioned, is not something that happens just between two drugs alone. It could be either between your drug and diluent or your drug and adjuvant as well. So, you know, when you uh, when you prepare a drug, it's not just the drug or the diluent that goes along with it. There are a lot of other adjuvants as well in order to uh, maintain its stability. So it could uh, be, it can also result in an incompatible reaction. So when do they occur? It can occur mainly uh, when you mix these two, get, two uh, solutions or two drugs together in the same IV bag or when you administer one drug right after the other without proper flushing of the IV line. Or as I mentioned earlier, it could be between the stabilizer and the solvent of one drug with the other. And, uh, and in some cases, uh, some incompatibility has also occurred between the drug and the IV, IV container material itself. So just to give a clear picture, I have uh, added a few pictures here of uh, the physical incompatibility that has more commonly occurred. So in the right side, you can see a turbid solution that has occurred because of the incompatibility between drug. It could be an either drug or, or uh, between a drug drug or a drug diluent. And uh, in the left top side, you can see a stopcock where there is physical uh, crystals that has formed at the end of the stopcock. So that's actually a physical incompatibility. And below, you can see the IV line with visible uh, precipitate. So that's that mainly most often occurs when you don't properly flush the line before the administration of the other drug. So what are the consequences of incompatibility? Why is it such a big deal? It's very simple. There are three to four points alone. First one, damage from the toxic products. So as I said, when there's a chemical incompatibility, some chemical reactions happen between the drugs or the different drug and solution, and it can lead even into toxic products that can actually lead to life-threatening condition of the patient. Second, uh, as you have seen in the pictures, you know, the precipitates that form, the crystals that form, it has a tendency to form particulate emboli, and that itself can cause another life-threatening condition to the patient. And third, most often you must have seen some patients with thrombophlebitis, you know, some kind of uh, discoloration of the skin or even tissue irritation. So these could be actually due to different incompatibility that had occurred between the drug. So when there is a different pH change, you know, when you administer one acidic and basic drug together, there are pH changes that can cause chemical incompatibility that in turn leads to tissue irritation in the patient. And the fourth and the most important one is a therapeutic failure. So when you, as I mentioned earlier, during the therapeutic incompatibility, when you administer two antibiotics in the thought that, okay, it will get a synergistic action, what you might end up doing is basically rendering the action of the other drug and hence lead to therapeutic failure. So keeping these in mind, I have prepared a few questions here. So I think this will give a better understanding of uh, the importance of choosing the diluent and about the drug incompatibilities. So here is uh, the first case. So first case, it's a 57-year-old man. He's a known case of decompensated chronic liver disease with portal hypertension. He was admitted with hepatorenal syndrome and encephalopathy. On admission, the patient had urinary retention and recurrent fever spikes. So to the same reason, we had sent a urine culture and it came out to be MDR, multi-drug resistant Klebsiella pneumonia. Now, as you can see the culture report, the only sensitive antibiotic was phosphomycin. So we started him on IV intravenous phosphomycin. Now, these are his labs. On day one, his procalcitonin level was 7. Creatinine level on the day of admission was 2.01. Gradually, it had improved. When you look at the uh, rest of the parameters, if you look at the sodium levels of the patient, on day one, it was normal. It was 140. But gradually, it started increasing. By day four, it has turned out to be 154. So my question here is, what could be the reason for hypernatremia? So phosphomycin is known to have high sodium load. 
even a uh, one gram of intravenous phosphomycin has comes to around 0.33 gram of sodium which is around 14.4 mil equivalents and the dose of intravenous phosphomycin comes to around 12 to 24 gram per day which is administered in two to three divided doses so in such cases what would be your diluent of choice right so in such cases you cannot give phosphomycin in sodium chloride so what then what is the next choice then dextrose so 5% dextrose is your diluent of choice for injection of phosphomycin now here what happened here the sisters were unaware of it usually we just give it with sodium chloride so the nurse administered the drug with uh, sodium chloride and hence it led into hypernatremic state so this was uh, we understood it by you know taking a minute and taking a conversation with the nursing staff and then we had informed we we basically we just uh, educated them on the importance of using dextrose whenever we give phosphomycin with the diluent of choice was changed and hence the patient's uh, situation was improved so that's the importance of choosing the right diluent so if you need to choose a right diluent the important part is you need to know your drug so as i said it's not just knowing the drug you know just okay fine this is phosphomycin and this is a dose you need to know what it contains and accordingly you need to choose a diluent and also you need to consider the patient state as well before you prescribe a diluent or the drug so moving on to the next case this is a 40 year old male post whipples procedure so whipples procedure is something that uh, we normally do for some pancreatic malignancy a major portion of the pancreas is removed now he was doing well initially post procedure period day 5 he developed fever spikes his inflammatory markers elevated but his procalcitonin norm, uh, pro procalcitonin levels were normal he gradually became hypotensive and uh, required intubation so we sent his bile culture and it was positive for filamentous fungi now the the drug of choice for filamentous fungi as you know is injection liposomal amphotericin but uh, so we started him on injection liposomal amphotericin accordingly and he was also empirically started on piperacillin tazobactam which is our beta lactam antibiotic and these infusions were administered separately now my question here is what would be the diluent of choice so i think uh, most of you must be knowing because uh, we always uh, make sure we mention it clearly when we uh, write the uh, drugs composition and everything we as strictly mention the diluent of choice as 5% dextrose so um so why is that so why is it important to actually give it with dextrose and not uh, why is sodium chloride cannot be used so liposomal amphotericin is basically it has a it's a, if you look at the structure it's a missile actually so if you go if you administer it along with sodium chloride or any solution that contains electrolytes it has it, it makes it incompatible or it makes it it's unstable and hence it forms a precipitate so it is very important to administer liposomal amphotericin or amphotericin for that matter with 5% dextrose only so here this was uh, i mean this was well, well aware of it because we had rightly mentioned it in the drug chart and the right diluent was chosen for administration yet there was a precipitation observed in the iv line now what could be the reason for that so here i would like to stress on the importance of flushing the iv lines properly before administration so when you know that particular drug is incompatible with a particular diluent you need to make sure the lines are properly flushed with the diluent of choice so in this case amphotericin is only compatible with dextrose so what ideally should have been done is that before administration of amphotericin the line should have been flushed with the dextrose and only then it should have been administered so that was not done and hence it resulted in a physical precipitate formation so that's the another important thing so second thing i would like to stress here is that not just make sure that the drug is right and the diluent is right you need to know you need to talk to your sisters about you need to educate the nursing staff as well here on the importance of the right way of administering the drug so moving on so here we have the next case so this is a 69 year old female is admitted with severe abdominal pain fever and chills since 4 days 
CT abdomen was taken and uh, she was diagnosed with acute pancreatitis. Now, she was started on uh, injection piprasil and tazobactam, 4.5 gram TDS. Now, there were a couple of other medications as well she was receiving. So, it includes injection pantoprazole, injection tremadol, injection ondansetron, and injection paracetamol. Now, here, uh, injection piprasil and tazobactam was administered as infusion over one hour. Simultaneously, she was given a bolus dose of pantop as well. But immediately after administration of precipitation was observed. So what do you think has possibly gone wrong here? Because she's, has, she's only receiving one antibiotic, which is Piptas. And the rest of the drugs are just uh, analgesics, antipyretics, then antiemetics or propagam inhibitors. So what could be possibly wrong here? So um, to know this, you need to look, you need to be aware of uh, your drugs. It's not just an antimicrobial alone that can cause incompatibility. Now, here I'm sharing an article where, uh, you know, this study was basically done in India by a pharmacy student, where they had looked into intravenous drug incompatibilities in the ICU setting. So what they observed here, as you can see in the table, um, so here you can see there is like continuous infusion. So most of the time we give antibiotics as continuous infusions, right? So you have you can see the different antibiotics uh, mentioned here. That is meropinum, piperacil, and tazobactam, metronidazole, amikacin, ceftriaxone, fluconazole, levofloxacin. So when these antibiotics are going as continuous infusions and simultaneously if you give a bolus dose of your proton pump inhibitor like pantoprazole or even your anti-emetic like ondansetron it is known to cause a visible precipitation they are known to be and documented as physically incompatible to each other so you might think that only certain drugs can cause incompatible. That's something that we might have uh, registered in our minds. Like, you know, okay, fine. This is just simple drugs. They might not cause any incompatibility, but that's where we are all wrong. So each drug has a potential to cause an incompatibility. And this has to be known. So pantoprazole is a well-documented to be physically incompatible with majority of your drugs. So when you administer such drugs, make sure that they are not given along with other drugs and you maintain a proper interval before the administration of such drugs. Now, I would like to share one more article where, you know, this, uh, where they looked into the compatibility of ondansetron hydrochloride with selected drugs during a Y-site injection. Now, as you can see in the table, uh, the different antibiotics that we use or the antifungals that we use, like amphotericin B, cefprazone, uh, giant cyclovir, which is your antiviral medications, and even piperacil and tazobactam, which is our antibiotic, it is known to be physically incompatible with ondansetron. So these positive signs that you see here, it uh, mentions the severity or the grade of uh, incompatibility that was observed. So it was known to uh, form a white flocculent precipitate or uh, even a pale yellow turbid solutions, etc. was found to be observed when these were given along with each other. So what is the reason? Why is ondansetron not compatible with these solutions? So the answer is ondansetron is basically an acidic drug. Its pH is around 4.5 to 5. So when these drugs are administered with, I mean, most of the antibiotics that we use or most of the drugs that we use are from mainly basic nature. So when they are administered together, it uh, tends to make it uh, chemically instable and hence it forms a physical precipitate. So this is mainly a pH dependent incompatibility. So you can say it is a chemical incompatibility that manifests as a physical incompatibility. So to this uh, get a clear picture of this, I want to mention one more case. So here is a 56 year old female post subtotal gastrectomy. Now she was started on injection cefparazone salbactam, two gram IV twice daily post-op. So here I have mentioned, I have uh, put the drug chart of the patient here. So if you look here closely, um, injection magnets, two gram baby is administered morning 6 a.m. and night 6 p.m. Now here are the rest of the medications uh, she is receiving. Um, there's injection pantoprazole, 40 mg OD, 6 a.m. injection paracetamol, one gram TDS, 6 a.m., 12 p.m., 10 p.m. Then injection 4 pam, 20 mg TDS, 
injection tramadol 50 mg tds and there is your injection emicet which is ondansetron 4 mg iv tds administered at 6 am 2 pm and 10 pm so what is the thing that has gone wrong here so here you need to look at the time of administration of these drugs if you see magnix administered at same time and at the same time during the infusion time itself they had given pantoprazole and emicet all through the same line so is it the right way of administering the drug no so you know there is a documented physical incompatibility between them so in such situations what is to be done you need to maintain a minimum gap a minimum gap of at least 30 minutes to 1 hour before administration of such drugs or uh, make sure the line is properly flushed prior to administration of the next drug so moving on uh, we have the next case here uh, this is a 55 year old man post live donor liver transplantation recovering well in what now post operative day 9 he developed a surgical site infection so the culture was sent uh, from the surgical site from the tissue and it was positive for e coli and pseudomonas aeruginosa and he was started on injection by prescilin tazobactam your beta lactam antibiotic and injection emicacin which is an aminoglycoside so this was based on the culture sensitivity and since the patient was quite sick we administered two antibiotics together for you know a better action and it was administered simultaneously so uh, my question here is that is it recommended is it recommended to give a beta lactam and a neoglycoside together so it's already mentioned in the slide no it is known to be chemically incompatible to each other now what is the reason so here you can see the beta lactam the nucleophilic ring of the beta lactam antibiotic it reacts with the amine of the aminoglycoside and it tends to form an inactive amide so here what happens is that the chemical the, it's a chemical reaction that occurs between the bet between them and which in turn leads into a therapeutic incompatibility so you have an inactive amide there so you might administer both the drugs together in the thought that okay it will get a better action but no it's actually rendering the uh, medicine off its effects so this is what is mentioned in the article here as well and one point i would like to stress is that not all aminoglycoside reacts in the same way so as it uh, as it's mentioned in the second uh, line here uh, gentamicin and tobramycin these are activated to a greater extent than amikacin or nitrilmycin um so but even though that's the case we generally do not recommend to be simultaneous administration of an aminoglycoside and a beta lactam antibiotic it's a well documented chemical incompatibility that exists between them so moving on to the next case um this is a 45 year old male who's post live donor liver transplant patient his routine day 3 blood culture was positive for enterococcus species and e coli so the patient is uh, having a gnb infection as well as a gpc now he was already started on injection piperacillin tazobactam 4.5 g tds along with it uh, we started him on injection vancomycin based on its culture sensitivity now both these drugs were given simultaneously so again is it uh, recommended to give a beta lactam or beta lactam antibiotic with vancomycin answer is no so here you can see uh, the well documented uh, article here where it has already been studied and documented that it is actually incompatible to each other so it's not just a uh, beta, beta lactam antibiotic but also even the uh, amphotericin b liposome that we use as an antifungal uh, there is a known physical incompatibility that occurs between vancomycin and uh, beta lactam as such as well as your amphotericin b liposome so these drugs are not to be given together as a simultaneous infusion now if it's necessary in such cases what would you then i mean what would you do then i mean is it like uh, if you do not administer the drug at all no so as i mentioned earlier in such cases what you need to do is at least maintain a proper gap between the administration of these drugs or the other thing that you can do is at least flush the line properly before the administration of the next drug because it might be a life threatening condition or the patient might not be well so you need to administer the drug at the same time as well so what would you do then so that's what you can do in such cases so um now coming to these uh, studies so here 
it's uh, these incompatibility reactions and these dilution things that has been looked into by various uh, people around the world and there are like lots of article out there you can find online so this is just the pictures this uh, few articles that i've uh, mentioned here so they have basically looked into the drug related problems or uh, the drug incompatibilities that are associated with intravenous drug administration and you can see here the first uh, the, this is the um, compatibility chart they have prepared like this is from the first article that i had mentioned so they have actually come up with a drug incompatibility alert card and you can see here they have rightly mentioned they have documented which drugs are compatible and which are incompatible now uh, if you remember me saying in my previous slides pantoprazole the proton pump inhibitor you might think is okay i mean it is, is it okay to administer with most of the drugs but if you look at the incompatibility that has been mentioned here it is actually incompatible with most of the drugs that we use be it acyclovir amikacin or azithromycin clindamycin piperacin and azobactam vancomycin so it's it's well documented incompatibility that occurs between them it is actually physically incompatible so in such cases you need to rightly administer the drugs accordingly and now there are other drugs that has been mentioned as well which are you know they have documented well which is non compatible and which is compatible now coming to the second one this is another compatibility chart one hospital has prepared so this one is a better one because they have rightly mentioned the drugs that are basic and uh, those are acidic so as i mentioned uh, when i meant when i talked about the ondansetron what was the reason for the uh, incompatibility there it's mainly because ondansetron was an acidic drug so because of the ph instability it led to a, a chemical incompatibility that was actually uh, manifested as a physical incompatibility so here you can see they have rightly mentioned or rightly highlighted the basic drugs and acidic drugs here and uh, in the left side you can see those columns uh, so the red one it marked is the uh, drugs that are physically and chemically incompatible and the green boxes that you see here is they mention the y site incompatibilities so this is another drug chart i mean this is another compatibility chart you can look into but one point i would like to stress is that it's always better to prepare a compatibility chart based on the commonly used drugs in your hospital or in your icu or in your wards so um it's not just uh, something that has to be prepared in an icu setting alone even in the wards or even um uh, in the periphery or the rooms or whatever wherever the patient is you need to make sure these drugs and the compatibilities are looked into and these are well documented based on your hospital setting so that's something that can be used as a reference for the nursing staff and the other physicians as well so uh with that i would like to conclude by saying a, just a very simple take home message that i would like to stress on it's a is a little thing that matters so as i stressed again and again throughout my slide it's not just about knowing your drug it's also about knowing the diluent and knowing the right way of administering your drug and also the as and also about the right way of right timing of administration so it's right diluent right timing and right administration and always remember the role of clinical pharmacist is not restricted to just dosages and dose adjustments alone so each time you look into a drug chart you need to critically analyze the drug charts just know that just um, keep it just assume that there is a mistake in the drug chart and then take a look into it and you will definitely find it there but in order to find it first you need to know so just like you know a famous saying goes the eye does not see what the mind does not know so unless you know about it or unless you know about the drug or know about the diluent you won't find that mistake there so it's very important to keep yourself updated to understand or to know what the error is in that particular setting and my third and most of uh, important advice to everyone would be to pass on what you learn so it's not just about learning and keeping it to yourself make sure you pass on what you know and what you have learned to your peers or to your colleagues educate your nursing staff educate your physician don't think that don't just assume that they know each and everything and just don't keep that with that assumption just don't do anything just pass on what you learn and that is the best way you can make sure that what you have learned is stuck in your mind forever so with that i would like to conclude my session uh these are my references 
And a quick point uh, before uh, signing off. Uh, so we have the second set of presentation from Basic Model Critical Care Forum, uh, which is Introduction to Shock, which will be taken by Shubham V. Kandare on 29th of March, Friday, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you so much for your uh, patient listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arita. It was actually a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, to be frank, that I never seen a presentation on uh, um, IV dilution or any kind of drug incompatibilities. Any session or any kind of presentation, I never seen it. This is the first time, I guess, and it was so elaborated and uh, with the live examples and all the photos which you had live. And uh, hope everyone would have been uh, understood. Uh, it was it was a very good knowledge gaining session for all the clinical pharmacists and even for the pharmacy students i guess okay so uh, so i just wanted uh, I, before starting the questions i just wanted to disc, uh, share one of my recently have uh, uh, encountered with one chemical incompatibility I just wanted to share it for a knowledge um the one with meropenum and uh, potassium chloride so suddenly when i just went for a rounds and i I came across a patient who with patient uh the meropenum and potassium chloride was going at the same the, in the same site with uh, with concurrently it was going and when I checked with the uh, literature it was it I found that almost ten percentage of meropenum will be lost when potassium chloride when it is given with potassium chloride so I just instructed them instructed staff nurse to flush it and yeah uh, what you mentioned about the flushing also so flushing is also plays a major role in the setting. Uh, okay, so few questions. And yes. uh, the first one is, um, in case of hyperglycemic condition, um, if, uh, per, if a patient has to be administered with polymyxin or amphotericin, so what would be the choice of dilute? Because we can't dilute uh, amphotericin or polymyxin with uh, NS, right? So in such conditions, what would... What would be the choice? So, uh, that's a great question, actually, because we have uh, certain situations like this. But like, uh, for example, as you mentioned here, hypoglycemic situation, you need to administer the drug. And what could be the choice of drug? So um, I think uh, we have no other choice because, as I said, it's actually incompatible because it actually precipitates out. So you can't choose a normal uh, saline in such cases. And also lactate linger, lactate linger, why I would suggest is that same thing. There's a sodium uh, chloride, potassium chloride, everything included. It's basically your electrolytes. You cannot give that as well. So in such conditions, what you would have to do is just give the uh, insulin doses of, you know, high dose of insulin you might have to give in order to cover that state because that's the only way to administer the drug because the patient is in a uh, situation where he requires amphotericin. So that means the patient is quite ill because it's something that we usually reserve for very critically ill patients or, you know, in such uh, serious conditions. So I think uh, what we require is mainly an endocrine consultation and uh, and accordingly, we need to give uh, insulin doses in such a way that his sugars are under control. Okay. Thank you. So I got one, one more question, uh, but I guess this is not related to the topic which is discussed now. Um, the, uh, few literatures, few drugs, few actually few antibiotics have different uh, infusion time, right? So like for example, like ceftrioxone, we could infuse for five to 10 minutes or as a prolonged infusion or as an uh, intermittent infusion. So how far it is, how, so how could, how do you, how will, uh, how we will select the infusion rate? So any uh, criteria is that to select the infusion rate? When to so administer? I yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. So I think uh, most of the time that we uh, we select the infusion time based on uh, the actually the, when you look into the culture report as well, we can see whether the infection is actually a resistant one or how much how resistant is the drug and you can look into the MIC as well. So in certain cases, what happens is that the drug is completely resistant or we have only one or two drugs. That's a choice. And uh, the MIC might be, you know, between one or two, you know, you, that a medicine requires such high concentration as well. So in certain situation, what we need is that in, in such case of MDR infections, we need to give a prolonged infusions of or maybe extended infusions of drugs. So I think it majorly depends on uh, the culture that has turned out to be positive based uh, on the uh, severity of infection. 
and based on that you will have to choose your infusion time as well whether it has to be just a 30 minute or one hour infusion or is it to be given as an extended infusion like we give meropenem over 3 hour infusions so i think it uh, most often depends on that see for example if uh, the patient is positive for klebsiella and it is an mdr infection and uh, you know when and uh, in such situations when when we see recent uh, critical care ast like an e test to check whether the septazide may be vacuum is sensitive or not so in certain cases now what happens is that in most of our tertiary care hospital setting uh, all these klebsiella pneumonia are already resistant to these there is of antibiotics like ceftriaxone as well so in such situations the guideline says we need to give ceftriaxone along with estronium as a 3 hour infusion so 3 hour infusion tds based on the dose adjustment we need to give as a prolonged infusion so i think it majorly depends on your severity of infection and the culture reports as well i mean that depends on the severity and you can choose the infusion time thank you and uh, one more thing is um, uh, so if you are going to dilute any kind of antibiotic uh, with the dextrose so how long it can be stored or how long it can be infused because uh, we we don't uh actually follow those criteria and if you are going to dilute with tns and uh, normal saline will be we can use it for uh, prolonged infusion right so if you are going to use with dextrose there's a possibility of uh, uh, growth in the solution itself right? so how far we could uh, sal- uh use the antibiotic with the dextrose dilution right actually that's a good question because most of the time the nursing staff itself they ask us this question like the is this antibiotic like stable can we keep it outside can we keep it in room temperature or does it require uh, um i i mean like uh, refrigerator use as well so uh, what i have seen is that it actually uh, i have seen it to be varying uh, based on the brands as well because different brands use different kinds of adjuvant solvents to prepare the drug so when you actually take a drug you need to you first thing that you need to look into is the package insert so you know that all the drugs it comes along with an fda label or the package insert so they have very well mentioned the uh, the uh, the diluent that has to be chosen and also uh, it has very well documented the uh, stability of the drug as well and where it is to be stored so and most of the time And what happens is that it actually changes with the diluent as well because in certain cases it, they have documented like with if you dilute it with normal saline you need to keep it in certain temperature if it's dextrose as you rightfully mentioned it's actually there's a potential for the growth of the bacteria as well so in cert- certain cases where how it should be stored is very well documented in that so my word of advice would be simple you need to make sure you look into that fda or the package inserts and you need to follow that advice because it actually varies uh, with different brands most of the time the brand changes and their uh, the, the 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 advice they have uh, written it should be followed correctly so that would be oh well, yeah thank you and uh, yeah so i guess the final one uh, so from the clinical pharmacist point of view so uh if the patient is in what say so if the patient is in critical care or in a general setting so we could able to see the iv compatibilities whether the drug two drugs are going in a similar time right so if the patient is in any room side so how far a clinical pharmacist can go and check the patient so what's your so, input of? yeah yeah so that's actually that depends on how uh, active you are as a clinical pharmacist because most of the time is that we uh, most of the time what happens is that we we think that okay uh, we are just a clinical pharmacist how can we just enter the room and and how can we ask these questions because you know uh, the patients or bystanders they might not be comfortable with us we have that kind of thought that has been set in our mind and most of the time because of the same reason we restrict ourselves from doing a lot of work which is actually one thing that we need to change so be it an icu setting be it a ward or rooms you need to consider all the patients in a similar way because uh, these are all patients i mean these are all patients they are not like different from any in, in, in any different way they are they are just the same they are patients they are our patients so you need to take care of them in the similar way so uh, in the rooms i can understand because they are not under our surveillance like 24 hours because we are not seeing what is happening inside but uh, the sisters they do so it's uh, in such cases what you can do is first thing you can educate the nursing staff 
on, on a routine basis like you know what we do here is that you know on a monthly basis we conduct classes for nursing staff and we educate them on the commonly encountered in- incompatibilities or the commonly encountered errors that we usually see in the uh, ICU settings or beat ward and we educate them so accordingly they will get a better idea about it and if they have any queries they will rightfully approach us uh, to know the reason for it and what other thing we have we, we have to do so i think in such cases uh, that's the one thing you can do and the second thing is that you need to talk to the bystanders you need to talk to the patients that's the most important thing because as i mentioned if the patient is having a thrombophlebitis itself it's not something that has to be considered as in a silly way because that could be because of the drug that we are given or because of some incompatibility that has occurred there so you need to talk to your patients whether they're facing any adverse effect any side effects anything we need to talk to them unless we talk to them we won't know just don't assume that all they're talking to the nursing staff everything they're talking to the physicians because the physicians they have a restricted time they have a lot of other things to do as well so they will just look at the patient whether the patient is okay and then they will just leave but we need to take time because we have certain time we have such a bit more time to ourselves to do our roles so we need to talk to them we need to understand their discomfort and accordingly we need to notify the staff or the physicians and accordingly make changes to the drugs or in any possible way we can help so that would be my word of advice there okay so yeah the cme actually they uh, helps a lot right so yeah to point you wanted to yeah yeah, yeah right yeah. okay so thank you and uh, it was a short and uh, actually a Big, big knowledge gaining session, and uh, I think we are uh, we'll wind up the session. Also, so. yeah, thank you again, Dr. Harita, for wonderful presentation. Uh, presentation was very much uh, knowledgeable, and it was very uh, clear. Up, uh, I guess everyone would be clear about uh, drug dilutions and uh, incompatibilities. So yeah, so students, uh, so you can stay tuned for upcoming uh, interesting sessions like this. and thank you fcpa and thank you thank you so much fcpa thank you so much vishnu pal for the wonderful moderation